Hi everyone, welcome back to Numinosophy Academy, I'm Lewis. So I'm going to be taking a little bit of a hiatus from Mormonism and traveling down a, a different avenue of inquiry, namely American travelogues. And so in this vein, I have just um, recently finished uh, John Steinbeck's non-fiction book, uh, Travels with Charlie. So Travels with Charlie is um, John Steinbeck's account of a journey that he took um, across the United States, um, starting um, on Long Island, where he lived, on the uh, East End, then going up to Maine, and then traveling right across America, and then right around through Texas, and then back up the East Coast, back to Long Island. So I think it's interesting from, from a spiritual perspective, because it's about the, the journey. It's about um, wandering out into the unknown, um, which is of course a recurring trope um, within spiritual literature. Just think of Jesus's wandering in the wilderness or Moses's wandering in the wilderness until he could find the promised land. And of course, in the Book of Mormon, there is likewise um, wandering here and there. And, you know, why does, why does Jesus do this? You know, somehow that period in the wilderness, that 40 days being uh, tempted by the devil, is his way of kind of... Um, psychologically preparing himself for his ministry. At least that's always been my my reading um, of those passages. So somehow that uh, journey into the unknown gives him something, gives him some kind of uh, tool which allows him to more effectively do his mission. So within uh, psychological parlance, within Jungian parlance, uh, this is often called the hero's journey, um, which is a, a common trope that you find in, in much literature, in many films, um, in which the protagonist finds himself in a, a comfortable place, in his home perhaps, or you know, within his town of origin, and then he goes out on some epic journey um, usually with some kind of stated purpose at the outset, but not always. And through this journey, he undergoes various uh, trials and, and tribulations. Um, and through these trials, he um, grows as a person and is, you know, gains some reward for himself. Uh, sometimes that's a kind of um, a literal physical reward, but it's usually, or it's more often a kind of, um, I don't know, insight or, or piece of knowledge or, you know, some kind of way of perceiving the world and reality, which he can then, um, at the end of the, the movie or the book or the piece of literature, um, return back to his, his home and offer as a gift to, you know, whoever, his town people. And this book, um, Travels with Charlie very much follows that pattern. He has this initial longing to travel America. Um, you know, this is very much towards towards the latter half of his life, or the latter um, few years of his life. Um, so John Steinbeck, of course, probably most famously known for um, Grapes of Wrath and um, Of Mice and Men. Um, but this falls into his, supposedly, into the non-fiction um, arena. And I'll say, I'll say why I think only supposedly um, in a moment. But it's not really stated at the outset what his purpose is. But there's just some kind of longing to be out on the road, to get out and explore America in particular. Um, I think he feels like the America that he wrote about in his early literary life has changed so much now that we're in the early 1960s that he feels as a American writer, it is his duty and responsibility to familiarize, familiarize himself once again with the American people and the American continent. But it's, I don't know, it is kind of stated that way, but it feels like 
there is a um, unspoken reason, a kind of spiritual reason perhaps, or just something that cannot be articulated. There's some uh, call within us to, to be on the road or to be walking and to travel out um, in search of something that we cannot know. And he says early on in the book, all these various people that he encounters, uh, he articulates to them the fact that he's on this road trip, this journey, and they're jealous, right? They, they wish themselves that they could go exploring or out on a journey. And then he asks, well, why are you unhappy? You know, do you hate your job? And they're like, no, you know, it's just, it's just, the home and the settled life is a known life. It's a bland life where the out there, whatever that means, is an unknown. So he does um, uh, admit at one point in the book that he's not writing this as he goes along, right? Because I, when I kind of think of travel logs, I suppose I'm kind of envisioning someone that's perhaps on the road and, you know, as they go from town to town to town, they're going into coffee bars and they're sitting down um, with their laptop or back then just a notepad and writing down their, um, their day or their experiences that they're going to then later compile and edit down into what will be their complete travel log. John Steinbeck does not do that. He admits he does not do that. He says that um, he needs all the, the content to be absorbed into him um, in order that he can um, write the complete journey when he's back at home. And that raises questions about just how non-fiction this book is. So, you know, he's explaining these places as he goes um, across the United States um, and he's encountering various people along the way. And so this book is punctuated with these um, conversations, almost always one-on-one -on -one conversations um, that he has with um, strangers. And, you know, he makes a point of saying that it is his purpose in encountering strangers. And he talks about um, the best ways to, um, to communicate with strangers. So he talks about uh, asking people for directions um, in order to um, begin a dialogue with something. Of course, that wouldn't really work today with sat -nav, nav and everything. Um, he talks about kind of absorbing ordinary conversation by going to bars, coffee shops, and on Sundays going to churches, just in order that he can kind of get the flavor of the people in these various places. So these dialogues are presented as if they are you know, accounts of what actually happened. Um, so for example, very early on, he's uh, in New England and he encounters a waitress um, who he describes as being, um, you know, a soul-sucking individual, a deadly boring um, individual, which seems to just um, suck all life and purpose and joy uh, out of everything. And, well, I'm not convinced it really happened, basically. I think all of these all of these um, dialogues that take place is all just his kind of um, exploration of what these people within these various states are like. It's his kind of musing about what these people are like, but they're not actual recordings of actual people. Maybe they're like composites of, of like little snippets of conversations he had. So that conversation uh, early on in New England stands out. Um, at one point, he's even looking up into um, the sky and uh, sees the uh, Northern Lights. And he fantasizes about getting this um, restaurant server to, to, to join him and look up at the sky um, in order that, you know, some kind of majesty of the universe can be injected into her in order that she can kind of, uh, you know, see that um, the horizons of the universe are, are larger than she than she reckons. Um, but then he goes into a, a pessimistic state and goes, no, probably even she being such a, a glum and oppressive person would uh, suck the majesty even out of this moment. So that's one 
kind of encounter that really did stick out to me. Um, a bit later on in the book, uh, he drives through um, Montana, the state of Montana, and he, he gets kind of um, enraptured by the beauty of that state and, you know, talks about it as being the most beautiful state uh, within the Union. Uh, that encounter or that um, part very much stuck out to me. Um, when he arrives down in California, eventually, he has a dialogue with someone that used to know him because he used to live um, in kind of um, central California, that kind of area. And that's another conversation um, that stuck out to me because, you know, the California that he knew when he was younger is not the California as it is now. And that's an interesting thing about the book. You know, he's writing this in the early 1960s. And so he's observing the changes that have happened from the 1940s, the 1950s, into the 1960s. And so he's commenting on things like the appearance of vending machines, which, you know, to him is a um, a questionable technological marvel. Um, he comments on the vast proliferation of plastic, for example, going into diners and everything being made out of plastic. You know, something that we would just kind of take as pretty... Uh, commonplace today, but it's um, it obviously stands out to Steinbeck. Um, he then, w when he eventually um, gets through the Arizona desert region, um, which he doesn't say much about. I mean, that's kind of the odd thing about this book. It's a travel log, but he actually doesn't say that much about the various places that he visits. Um, you know, he spends a lot more time, he travels with his dog, uh, Charlie, who's a, a French poodle, and he spends much more time talking about his poodle um, than he does talking about uh, the places he encounters, with the exception of places like Montana. You know, he very much does um, anthropomorphize um, his dog. There's even a point in the book where he puts speech directly into the dog's mouth and he has a direct one-on-one -on -one dialogue with the with the dog so he doesn't talk about place that much um it, it's more focused on these various dialogues but as i said i don't think these dialogues actually happen so it's a weird kind of travel log um in that respect it's more kind of encapturing um the spirit of travel or the spirit of of going out uh, rather than um, I don't know, a faithful rendition of, of what going out would actually entail in practice. That's my kind of impression anyway. So he eventually gets to the Arizona desert and um, he reluctantly arrives in Texas. And there's, there's quite a bit about Texas, which is quite interesting. You know, the extent to which Texas, the Lone Star State, is uh culturally very much set apart from the rest of the united states and the oddity um of texas you know he talks about it more or less being its own country um in every respect apart from the fact that it's of course not um and the the kind of i don't know decadence of um rich people in texas and how that oddly contrasts with um, the rest of America. And then that's more or less it. Um, he then makes his very quick journey um, back from, from Texas up to um, Long Island. No, there is one, there is one further notable um, happening, um, which is uh, he passes through Louisiana. And as this is the early 1960s, um, segregation is um, very much in play. And he goes to um, one of these incidents in which um, whoever it was, the federal police or the federal guard or whoever it is, escorting um, black children into white schools in order to force the end of segregation. And... And that kind of leads on to a couple of conversations about race, which are quite interesting, given that he's, of course, speaking in the 1960s. So uh, it doesn't read in the way that we would kind of think about 
race today. Um, keep in mind also that I am speaking about this issue as an outsider. The way race is thought about in the United Kingdom and the way that it's thought about in the United States is very different. But how would I characterize it? I guess John Steinbeck is kind of appalled and disgusted by racism, as you would kind of expect, being a Yankee liberal, I suppose um, you could characterize him as, um, for that time, 1960s. However, he's not like a, um, you know, a zealot against racism. He, he doesn't really think that, um, I don't know, our deeper feelings are going to be resolved through the overcoming of this hurdle. And so he has one conversation during this period with a uh, Greco-American who says, and you know, as I said, I don't think this is really an encounter. In a way, this Greco-Roman is kind of articulating something that John Steinbeck wants to be articulated, but he doesn't want it being articulated out of his mouth, if that makes sense. So in a way, you can kind of take this voice as being a voice within John Steinbeck. But this voice articulates um, this belief that this victory, the um, desegregation of schools, um, won't ultimately satisfy um, the Negro population of, Amer of, of America. Um, which I think is quite, is quite a prophetic statement. Um, you know, we've obviously come a hell of a long way since um, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, regarding the whole race issue. And yet the race issue today um, is still very much uh, alive and beating in the United States. So, but of course, that kind of attitude can obviously lead to a kind of apath uh, apathy in the face of the need for change. So, um, you know, in a way, the, the beauty of being um, an author of a book like this is you can have all these various opinions being voiced by different individuals, but you or your own ego or the, the front that you present to the world um, doesn't have to represent those particular positions, if that makes sense. You can kind of uh, hold the complexity by um, recognizing that we contain multitudes and we contain the Greco-Roman man who is a bit more skeptical. We contain the oppressed black man or oppressed black girl trying to get into school. We contain the uh, fuming at the mouth mother um, who is um, full on racist and we contain the appalled um, man or woman crying out for justice, right? So we can contain that, that breadth, that complexity. Okay, so that's more or less it. And then he winds his way back to Long Island. The other thing which is re recurring throughout the book is um, his irritation with rules, right? He occasionally runs into um, border police or police in other respects or other kind of arbitrary rules. And he does kind of articulate his kind of um, anarchic idealism um, in those moments. Uh, his wish that he could just be left alone to do his own thing, which for the, for the most part he is, which I think is um, a large part of the appeal to traveling the breadth of America. It's part of that draw. It's something that definitely appeals to me um, going out, I guess that's, you know, partly why I read the book, this desire to, to, to go out and experience America the nature in America, the people of America. I can't fully articulate why I feel like that, and nor do I think John Steinbeck really articulates why he feels like that. Um, it just feels like the thing that one should do. It feels like the done thing for some reason. Um, 
partly I think because there is that freedom over a huge breadth. The United States is obviously very large. Um, but also just something about the American spirit being a part of that. I don't know, it's difficult to say. Um, over the course of the book, although John Steinbeck, as I said, kind of sets out with no real purpose, he does kind of slowly move towards this idea that his purpose is to know the American people and to be able to characterise what an American is, um, which he recognises as a futile task. And again, I'm not, I'm not really convinced by that. I'm not really convinced that he had this question of who is the American and then came to the conclusion that um, the American, of course, is uh, a great multitude of, of various um, characters and personalities. Because it's so obvious a point, I feel that it's really just inserted as a kind of literary trope in order to create structure within the book in order to suggest that there is movement, not just in terms of geographical movement, but in terms of um, the appreciation of the author as to the significance of his own journey. Okay, so this is potentially the beginning of um, a series that I'm going to do um, on various travel logs. Um, if that interests you, please do uh, like this video and subscribe and I'll have another um, American travel log book um, coming up in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, cheers for watching. Thanks in particular uh, to my uh, Patreon supporters whose support is, is very much um, appreciated. Thanks again and I'll see you in the next one.